Good afternoon, friends. Welcome to uh, our next session here on biblical literature uh, for the modern world. And it's going to be presented by our two biblical uh, studies faculty here, uh, Nick Ladd and Michelle Hirschberger. Just a, a quick word, Michelle is on her way here. She's not quite here yet because she's actually teaching one of our hybrid courses right now. Um, and she's going to try to end early and get here, but, but Nick's going to get us started and Michelle's going to come in and, and, and join us. So just to give you a heads up on that. But before Nick comes up, I, I want to give you just a brief introduction um, on the why of the biblical literature class. So one of the things at Heston College that, that I've spoken to is, um, make no mistake, we're a Christian college from an Anabaptist perspective. And, and in that, we do require every single student that gets a Heston College degree to take this course called Biblical Literature. And in this course, our faculty will, will work through the whole Bible from start to finish. And, and you're gonna hear about that today. And, and the impact that that has on us on our journey, spiritual journey, which takes on uh, different pieces. And, and I would argue where this course is important for us is it actually speaks about discipleship and following Jesus ultimately. Oftentimes in college, we can get pretty heady. Um, I was just talking to one of our faculty members and, and he talked about this idea of a Pez dispenser where you sit there and, and you, open up, you open up the head and you keep cramming it with all these little pez and then you spend the rest of the time just out, right? Um, whereas this course takes what's important for us here at Heston and takes it to a very deep level for our students. And I believe this course is one of those distinctives that places what I call the Heston College thumbprint on our students when they graduate. We have students here who have come for, work towards an associate's degree, and will leave Heston College without taking this course. Well, that student will never get a diploma with my signature on it. So they might have been here for two years, they chose not to take this course, and they'll go on, because they well, I don't need this course. Where I'm going, that's fine. But this course is very important for us, and so today, Nick and Michelle are gonna share what this is about and why this is important. And as we go forward, um, especially as we look at adding, you know, we've added these four bachelor degrees today as we continue to lean into Vision 2025, what does spiritual formation look like at Heston College? And, and what does that character formation look like at Heston College? I would continue to say uh, this course is one of those foundational pieces for us. So Nick and Michelle, uh, thank you for taking this time. Uh, we look forward to hearing what you have to say. <clears throat> yeah, uh, hello everyone. I'm Nick uh, Ladd and Michelle will be here soon. So just a little bit uh, about me and we'll see if Michelle gets here in time. If not, I'll say a little bit about her, which many of you probably know uh, her a little better. But I'm starting my sixth year teaching here at Heston College and had the pleasure of working with Michelle in the Bible department. And we, this particular class, Biblet, we team teach. So all of our on-campus sections of Biblet, we team teach together. So we're there pretty much every day, unless one of us isn't. Um, <laughs> and then, so we share the load. Um, we sometimes teach together the same day, going back and forth. Sometimes one of us teaches, the other one, uh, you know, takes a break. But we uh, work together pretty closely. So. This year also, uh, something new for us, we uh, are both taking on the role together as campus pastors. So Michelle and I both are co-campus pastors this year, so we've adjusted our teaching loads a little bit and reduced a few things to be able to take that on. So that seems to be uh, a really good experience so far, and again, we're used to working together, so it seems to, to work for the two of us to team that together. So. Yeah, we have a lot going on, but Biblet, honestly, is uh, the reason I'm here. Um, without Biblet, I don't, I don't think I would be here uh, at Heston College teaching. So it's really personal to me, super important, 
And I hope today some of the things that we share, um, yeah, will come through just how passionate both Michelle and I are about it. So I've taught public school. Um, I've pastored in different places. I'm originally from Michigan. Um, but yeah, we've been out. I came through some of you. How many of you remember the PM program, Pastoral Ministries program? A bunch of you. Yeah. So I came through that program. We moved out here in 2012 to 14. So I came through that, and then we went back to Michigan, and I pastored for uh, four years, and now we've been back already. So uh, starting my sixth year. So yeah, Michelle, uh, most of you probably know Michelle. She's been here like since the dark ages, so <laughs> I can say anything I want about her because she's not here to defend herself or stop me. Uh, <laughs> Michelle was one of, uh, yeah, one of the profs here when I came through the PM program and was really influential in in my learning during that time and uh, really has just become a long, lifelong friend of mine. So it's really, I, I think, just a great honor for me to be able to teach with her here. I think she is in her like 24th or fifth year. I don't even know for sure. Does Andy, do you have that stat? No, so something like that. 24, yeah, I thought it was 24. Andy knows all the stats of everything, so if you, yeah, <laughs> somewhere in there. Okay, so she's been here a long time, teaching Biblet the whole time. Uh, she started with Marion Bontrager, uh, who developed the course originally. Hey, Michelle, I'm just talking about you. But uh, Russell has a mic for you. Russell has a mic for you. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so she's been here quite a long time teaching Biblet. And, again, it's definitely changed and adapted over the years. And we still feel like it's very relevant to our students in 2023. Okay. Maybe, maybe even more relevant than it was 20 or 30 years ago. Maybe. So I'm curious uh, a little bit about some of you, some of your faces I definitely know, but how many of you actually graduated from Heston? Are you an alum? Yeah. How many of you, and I know some of you would not have, but how many of you took Biblet when you were here? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so some of you are pre-Biblet. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good, good. Um, so... What are, are there any things that you remember uh, from Biblet? Some of you. I know Michael Smalley, I get to work with Michael Smalley now because uh, being, <laughs> being the campus pastor. So I know his, some of his answers, but some of the rest of you, like, are there things that you remember from Biblet that when you were here as a student? We'd be super excited to, if any of you are courageous enough. Hermeneutics. Hermeneutics. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good. Yeah, that's a big word, yeah. <laughs> hey, Michelle, this is Michelle. I just said you've been here since the dark ages. Yeah. I told everything exactly accurate about you. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure, yeah, don't only believe half of it, yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, 24 years. Yeah. Hermeneutics, yeah, good. <clears throat> Hermeneutics. I actually came to Heston College pre-Biblet. That's how, yes, that's, that's how old I am. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just well, pre, yeah. right? Just before? Uh, yeah, I missed it by about four years. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. So, it's been around. Yeah. Are there questions? We thought we'd start with this, like, because we get lots of questions. We know people in advancement get lots of questions. But do you have questions specifically related to BibLit that you'd like us to talk about? I'm yeah. I don't have I, the exact I year. I think 85. That's yeah. one thing I don't know. You, 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 Part? Foundies, foundation one, two, three, four was Well, it was kind part of, of foundations later on. I took foundies and there was. The pre-Biblet, some of the foundations of Biblet I did take in a Bible class. Mm -hmm. But the actual, what we now call Biblet, I graduated in 81 and I think four years later it started. Yeah. Great question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anybody else? And there might be yeah. more questions as we go along too, but. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the questions, well, that we often get is, yeah, how is it, how can you still be teaching this to students in this day and age? Like, is it relevant? We're going to talk about some of those questions, uh, what we think. What hasn't, so we have changed a lot of things. Um, Michael will say we've made it too easy because some of you maybe did two or three inductives. We only make them do one inductive. Uh, sorry, those of you that took it years ago <laughs> with Marion. Uh, I had to do two inductives also only, mm -hmm. what, 10, mm -hmm. 11 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so 
we have tried to make a few things easier and a little bit less work for them. These are some things that definitely have not changed. Yep. Yeah? We, we still, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> we long, long to help people fall in love with God and the Bible. And we're upfront about that. So we play a little, we do this little tension, this dance of, we want our non-Christian students and our, our students who are atheist, agnostic, who practice other faiths, who are not sure where they're at, we want them to feel our care and respect and that we are listening to them and their way of seeing the world. We care deeply to do that. But we also want to be very clear, because we care about all of our students, to be pretty upfront that we love Jesus and the Bible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Both at the same time. Just both at the same time. Yeah, I think one of the overarching goals has always been, and still is, to remove the barriers to understanding the Bible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's a big chunk of what we're going to share with you today. So mm -hmm. uh, barrier number one that we hear often is the Bible maybe just isn't relevant anymore. So is this book, uh, you know, just a few years old, 20 years old? <laughs> it's ancient, right? Ancient text. How could this possibly still be relevant in 2023 in the day of internet and cell phones? Maybe we should just throw it in the garbage. Ooh. Is that right? No. <laughs> Michelle's going to cringe. No. Yeah. We don't think we should throw it in the garbage quite yet. But is it true that there's a lot of things in here that are difficult to understand? If we're being honest, have you read some stories in here and open it up and tried to read and be like, I have no idea what that is? Yeah? Or what in the world did that mean? I don't mm -hmm. get it. Yeah. There are just simply examples that we don't get or understand, right? How many of you have spent uh, the whole summer raising all of your food and storing it, every bit of it, that you're going to eat the rest of the winter? Anybody? All of your food? By hand? No machines? Maybe? Yeah. No. Yeah. No one? Yeah. So some of the examples in here, right? Some of the examples in here about farming by hand and doing some of those things it's, is it possible we don't understand those examples? That's possible, right? So uh, it's, it is a valid, I think, uh, reason that some people give us. Like, it's just not relevant. But here's what we say to that. Uh, or Would that's why. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Ooh, yeah. Can oh, I can think that? of a weird story that makes no sense. <laughs> and we almost were going to do this with the hermeneutical bridge. We decided not to open up this can of worms. But go there. Genesis 38. Tamar sleeps with her father-in-law and gets pregnant, right, disguising herself as a prostitute, and she's more righteous than he is. Now, I don't know about you, but the first time I read that, it's like, yeah, I, I'm too polite to rip that page out of the Bible, <laughs> but I might as well have, because you know what? I was never going to preach from that text ever, right? Mm. Or just, we're just not even going to do it. We're just going to pretend it's not there. But... If you know the context, there's a lot of good stuff in that story for us. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So one of the things, the major thing that we do that we start off the class with is what we call an inductive Bible study, which is just a really deep dive into one specific story. Uh, and we're going to illustrate that in a minute. But our answer to this question is that the Bible isn't relevant is this, that contexts change. So farming practices might change. But the eternal truth of the story doesn't. There's still an eternal truth that we can learn or get from that. So we draw... Uh, oh, so you're going to... Since I'm here, was I... Oh, sure. Oh, yeah, yeah was, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't think I'd get here this soon. We here worked we this yeah. out so perfectly. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> so we draw what we call hermeneutical bridge, uh, which somebody... I'm so glad that one of you alumni remembered that word, hermeneutic. So hermeneutical bridge and... This illustrates the inductive Bible study and also illustrates our uh, purpose, our point of context change, but eternal truth doesn't. It illustrates how we can take a book that's thousands of years old or a story that's thousands of years old and still get some meaning or application for us today that's really valid and really important. So <clears throat> we always start uh, over on the right-hand side and... The first thing we encourage the students to do is take off the best they can their worldview glasses. So we spend quite a bit of time talking about our worldview and what does that mean, uh, like our mental map of reality, what we think, because my worldview might be different than your worldview, just based on I was born and raised in Michigan, right? That's 
far superior to people that were born and raised in Missouri. Like, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, <Yeah. coughs> maybe not superior, but it is different, right? It is different. Michelle and I have a different worldview simply because we were raised in different places, different mm -hmm. times, different, yeah? Does that make sense? So our worldview impacts how we read the Bible and how we interpret it. So we always uh, start with taking off our worldview glasses. We start in 2023. Uh, and then we hop on the bridge and we go across back into just, we call it Bible times, because again, that could be lots of different years if we're trying to figure that out. But we call it Bible times, so we're going back in time and we're leaving our worldview glasses behind here because we're trying to really get into the story. We're trying to understand everything we can about the story the best we can from their perspective. So the first step is just observation. And uh, in the observation step, students it's the most work and every year this is probably the thing that gets worse and worse is like we ask them to actually go to the library and use bible dictionaries uh to look up words and terms to understand to learn historical cultural context so no. uh in this modern age that's probably the thing that's the hardest mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it works really well for them to get uh an understanding of the context of the story understanding concepts that we just don't understand today that are different for us. Even simple things sometimes, like women, uh, we all know what women are, but is it possible that women were treated differently, women had different roles, responsibilities, rights in Bible times, right, than they do today in 2023 in, in the US? So sometimes they're words that we already know, but we still have them look up and try and find what was different uh, back then. So again, trying to really get into uh, the mindset of that time period. The second step then is analysis, where we really just uh, tear apart the story and break it apart into its literary elements and, uh, and then put it all back together eventually. But analyzing uh, the story and literary context to try and get, again, more understanding, deeper knowledge about that time period and what it meant for, for the original people. The third is then uh, where we work on interpretations. So coming up with what was the meaning, and we always talk about the meaning for the original audience. So in this step, notice we're still on the Bible time side of the bridge. We're not in 2023. So how many times, and again, we would say there's different types of Bible studies, and different types of Bible studies have good things about them and different times where they're good. This uh, type, inductive, we try and stay over there in Bible times for most of it, so the interpretations are the meanings for the original audience, not for us today in 2023. Meaning for the original audience. What did it mean? Uh, yeah, well, we're going to do an example here, um, mm -hmm. and we'll see if you can get the meaning for the original audience. But okay. <laughs> once we have the meaning for the original audience, it might be something that's really culturally specific for them that we might not understand, like leveret marriage. If if I die, my wife, then my brother should marry my wife to take care of her. Yeah. Leverant marriage law. It was That'd a really important law. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if my brother doesn't fulfill that, he's really bad. But in 2023, would we expect my brother to marry my wife if I died? Probably not. That's ridiculous, right? <laughs> so again, like we ask the question, should we just throw the Bible away? That's the meaning for the original audience. No meaning for me. Might as well just get rid of it. Or... <laughs> Or is there still something within that interpretation about leverant marriage that we call, what we look for then is the eternal truth. So what is it inside that law of leverant marriage? What was that trying to do? So in this case, we would say leverant marriage was trying to protect or care for widows, mm -hmm. right? It was trying to give them a home and to give them an income and give them a place to live. All of those things they wouldn't have, they wouldn't have if they were a widow. They'd just be out on the street. They can't own property. They can't take care of their kids, they can't have a job, what do they have? Nothing. So uh, the eternal truth might be something about taking care, of, uh, taking care of widows. And then once we have an eternal truth, we grab that eternal truth and we go back over the bridge to 2023. And the last step that we do on this side is an application. So we take that eternal truth. How does it apply to us today in 2023? What can I do with that eternal truth uh, that impacts who I am and how I am and my faith and what I'm going to do. So in this way, this is our main answer to the Bible is just such an old, 
old book, it doesn't really make any sense, it doesn't have any impact, we would say, oh wait, it does, it does. have a huge impact. Every story. There's super important lessons that we can learn. Yep. So we're gonna run through an example that's one of our favorites and All a right. classic. Yeah. And Second see. Samuel mm. chapter 11, you may know it, or I'll jog your memory just for a little bit. <laughs> Uh, King, the, the Israelite armies, it's springtime, so it's time to go out for war. King David stays behind. He has a palace, and as he's out on his palace, he looks down, and he sees a lovely women, woman bathing. Her name is Bathsheba. He calls for her. They have sexual intercourse, and she conceives. And so, hmm, he <laughs> calls up her husband, who happens to be Hittite and not Israelite, and mm. says, hey, take a break from the war, sleep with your wife, have a good time. And Uriah says, no, I cannot do that. That's, that's not appropriate for me to do. So he sleeps on the floor of the palace. So King David throws a party the next night, gets Uriah, the, hit, the husband, a little bit tipsy, <laughs> and he still will not go home and have sex with his wife. He goes back to the war. And so David says, before you go, Uriah, here's a sealed scroll, and inside that scroll is basically his death sentence, telling Joab, to, when, the, when the fighting is heavy, to step back and then let Uriah be killed. Mm. Now, when most mm. of you, and remember, we can't ever totally take off our worldview glasses. I will always see the world, at least a little bit, as a Mennonite white woman from Missouri... <laughs> To in her super early 60s, right? I'll never be able to do it, but mm. I'm trying. Mm -hmm. In my Missouri Mennonite, all that context, I would have like, don't even need to do an inductive study with that story because we all know what the main interpretation is. Somebody tell me what it is. Don't. I hear it, yeah. Don't commit. You can say it. <laughs> adultery. adultery. Don't commit adultery. Because it's just so obvious, right? It, right? Goodness obvious. sakes. Is it, it? But is it? But is it? Is it and obvious? we love this. We love to do this in this passage for the deck. Because you can just see the students. They're sitting in their, they're sitting in their chairs and they're going, I've got this. <laughs> My stars. Why did they pick? This? I've got this. Is, you can just see this. This is so obvious on their faces. I mean, you can mm -hmm. just see it. So we start to piece things apart. Mm -hmm. We cross the bridge. We do observation where we, one of the things that we study is the concept of holy war. We also study what it means to be a Hittite. There's a lot of things we study. And, and, but let me just take the one just to be simple, the holy war. We learn that David was supposed to go out with the armies. We learn that there's all these rules of holy war that help make war a lot less likely to happen. Now, as good Mennonite Christians, we might go, well, there's no war supposed to happen at all. Well, you know, we can get there. But at this period of time, remedial will of God, which we talk about, we just realize, oh, my goodness, mm -hmm. and it, it, these rules are trying to make war less likely to happen. And David, what, the king, the Israelite king, was not doing them. One of those rules, the king was supposed to go out because it's too easy to call a war if you don't have to go and have your rear, rear end right on the yeah. front lines. Mm -hmm. Number two, what are you not supposed to have during holy war? Sex. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right. And the crazy thing is, and once the students get this, their little hearts, they just... Uriah, the foreigner... The immigrant, the one who was kind of seen as less than, obeys holy war rules to honor God more faithfully than the king. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, all of, so here for interpretation, we would have obey the rules of holy war. We think that that's an even more important interpretation than don't commit adultery. Although we let that one be there, it can be like number three or four, mm -hmm. obey the rules mm -hmm. of holy war. But now we're like, oh, well, we don't, we don't even do holy war. Well, then we start to see what are the eternal, what's the eternal truth of these rules? Well, it was by far and wide, 
to make it very difficult and very unpopular to have a war. I'm just speaking, why did we pick this story? It's, <laughs> it's I'm so blushing. good. There's so Ooh, many, so there's good. so many things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, m men who think about having a prolonged war and not being able to have sex for that whole entire time makes yeah. them think twice. I mean, yeah. it just does. It does. It just, yeah. it just does. <laughs> and so the it's eternal true. truth is, <laughs> yeah. is to work at ways at making violent conflict less likely, less yeah. likely and almost impossible to do. Mm -hmm. Now that one, that's mm -hmm. an eternal truth that crosses every cultural context and time period. Mm -hmm. And we can take that and we can make some dandy applications. I could go on and on this and on about Hittites and other things, but for, for yeah. I'm going to stop there. No, I think well, the, the other so thing beautiful. that this story, this story, the one of the reasons I love it is because another example or another thing it does is it shows the snowballing, what we call the snowballing effect of sin, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and it just shows like we often, how many of you have heard the story in some rendition in church, in Sunday school, like David and Bathsheba, and we just think, we go right to, right, like the adultery aspect, but there is so much there. Is the adultery aspect bad? Yes, but there's so much more to that than just the adultery and the snowballing effect that really starts with David not going to war with his army or sending his army out to war and not going with him. And it's just this tiny little bit right at the beginning of the story that, you know, we can miss. Uh, it's springtime when kings go out to war. But mm. where is King David? Sitting really happy in his yeah. palace. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll say the one more thing that we need to go to barrier yeah. two. Note the importance of literary context. We teach students this as well. We, if you just read chapter 11, you think David gets by with it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. But then there's chapter 12. Mm -hmm. Nathan the prophet. Oh, what a juicy story that is. Right? Yeah. <laughs> literary context. Yeah. All right. Here we go. Good, good. So, oh yeah, that's what we just did. We crossed the hermeneutical bridge. So we just did. <laughs> the second barrier that we often hear or complaint maybe about the Bible is it's just not user friendly, right? We just can't understand it. Is it? And again, like I was raised in the church. I went to church all the time. I read through the Bible as a teenager multiple times. And I still didn't really get like the whole sequence or understand. I knew lots of stories. Uh, but I wouldn't necessarily I could tell you like the one big story. Does that make sense? So I think oftentimes we learn lots of stories, individual stories, uh, but we don't necessarily know uh, how to put all those together. So the bookmark that you received um, is part of uh, how we help people to connect all of those stories. There's lots of little stories within the Bible. And... <laughs> I don't know if I can do it today. You've got, okay. to, do it. You've got to play your part. <laughs> There's yeah. lots of little stories, uh, but often in church we don't, we don't connect them. And how many of you know, like, is the Bible set up from beginning to end chronologically? Does it start in Genesis and just work through chronologically in order? No. There's places that you, you're reading along, especially in the Old Testament, and you get three books later, and you're starting to hear the same stories again, but it's told a little bit differently. Like, I thought I read that three books ago. Well, you did read that three books ago, because it's not put together chronologically, right? So to start in Genesis and just read through and think that you can just understand it yourself, well, you're probably a better scholar than I am. That's really difficult to do. So uh, what we have and what Marion helped uh, develop, and again, what we try and use and work with is the timeline. <laughs> and what was Michelle trying to find up here with her sweater? We often use a hat. That's I know, I couldn't hat, find my it's hat. It's okay, she couldn't find her hat. Again, you know, she's been here since the dark ages. <laughs> I don't know, it's lost. She's trying to find a hook. Right, right, right. She's trying to find a hook and she can't find a hook to hang her sweater on, to hang her hat on. So we talk about the timeline as being hooks hooks that you can hang your hat on, hooks that you can hang something on to help remember the story. And so we ask um, all of our students to learn the timeline. And we gave you, if you're here, a bookmark uh, there. If you didn't get one or you want another one, I think we have plenty. But some of the things are the elements on the timeline uh, that are really important. So we start here and just go through. So it starts in Genesis, 
Notice at the end, there's not really a defined end, but we say it connects all the way to us today. Why? Because is the story done just because we get to the last page of the Bible? No, we don't (laughs) think so either. So it is still living. Jesus is living. Uh, The story still continues with us today. So uh, there's lots of hooks on here or reminders. Oops, sorry. Uh, So a lot of these actual... Uh, these are time periods. There's actual stories that we, that we teach and ask the students to memorize. Uh, there's little asterisks, the asterisks on here uh, that we call crisis points, but they're not necessarily like bad things, but just a really big, a crisis like a turning point, something that changes, something that's different, uh, a big part of the story. These three questions down here are a big uh, hook that is... Um, What is the sin problem? Wow, I almost blanked out there. Well, yeah. (laughs) What is the sin problem? What's God doing about the sin problem? How faithfully are the people cooperating? Those three questions we can ask, like, as an overarching theme to the whole biblical story. There are also questions we can ask at each individual story that we learn and talk about as a way of kind of, like, evaluating. Do we understand this story? Do we not? What's God doing? What are the people doing? Um, How's that working out? So... This timeline really uh, helps uh, us to teach the class. It helps the students. Um, If you notice, even some of us get it tattooed on our bodies because it's super important. So I would say uh, this is what it it kind of saved and changed my life. I didn't grow up Mennonite. Um, I didn't grow up Mennonite. I was slowly brainwashed into Mennoniteism and and love it. But a big part of that was finally coming here through the PM program and learning this this timeline and connecting the whole Bible together in a way and seeing it as one big story just blew my mind, completely changed my life and my faith because now things started to make sense. Now all those stories that I learned in Sunday school that just seemed like isolated stories that taught me like, oh, you know, David as a kid, you know, trusted God so much he picked up a rock and killed a giant. Like we all need to have a lot of faith. Yeah, that's true. But where does that fit into anything else? Um, And what's behind all that? So learning the timeline uh, for me has been really, really important. And returning back here to teach, uh, I would say it saved saved me again. I was in a pretty bad place mentally and spiritually. And so learning it, teaching it, um, studying through the Bible and seeing over and over and over again how God keeps working with people, sometimes when they mess up in really bad ways, really big ways, and do you notice that? God doesn't say, eh, sorry, that's it, done. <laughs> See you later. Yeah. I haven't seen that. Yeah. God keeps working with them. Yeah. Let me tell you a little bit about what exactly we do. And we have been doing this since 1985. Mm-hmm. Um, we do something called Heilsgeschichte, which if you go on in biblical studies, you might hear that word. Although mm-hmm. you don't hear it as much anymore. It, it, for some people, it does have a little bit of baggage. But Marion Bontrager used it and. It's kind of stuck with us. But that means the whole big salvation story. And as Nick said, it's true. We're fairly unique, at least in this country, for teaching the Bible in this way instead of systematic theology to find a thread that makes all the little stories make sense into the big story. So every single student either says this completely by memory without notes, except for what you write for about five minutes when you go. So if you would come in to say or to tie piles, typing is about three hours to four hours, saying it is about an hour. Ethan knows all about this, yep. (laughs) You get a blank sheet of paper. Most students write the timeline, but you can write whatever you want, but you can't start with any notes. And the students are always apologetic at the first with me, and they say, I'll probably just look at my notes. I won't look at you. And I'm like, no, you, no. Because here's the deal. When you have to memorize that much, you internalize it. It becomes a part of you. And so that I've taken some students at at Mennonite Convention who who took Biblet five years earlier, and I said, you think, do you think you can do part of Hiles? And they're like, yeah, I think I can. <laughs> and I watched him do an hours of high, and, and the, without even studying, because it, it becomes a part. What's amazing to me is the fact, the idea that God is still working and is alive in this world and that God can work through them. 
I've watched student after student discover that as they did this. We have had students who have disagreed with us on some of this theology. That's okay because they are loved. Mm -hmm. We have had students that go, I'm not so sure about these miracles. And we say, that's okay. That's okay. And you can even see this as a psychological journey if you don't believe in God and spirituality. But my Muslim students, sometimes with just tears in their eyes, particularly as they talked about Abraham and Isaac and Ishmael. I've, we've, I've had tremendous experiences, and so has Nick. You're going to see a couple here in just a minute. But know that these students who think they're going to look at notes rarely do. They look right up at me, and they're always, they also worry about this. They say, you know, there's a, there's a type tiles in the back of your textbook. I'm like, yeah, I helped write that textbook. Yes, I do. <laughs> like, I just <clears throat> memorized that. I'm like, you memorized right. 11 pages. <laughs> I'm good with that. Because, yeah. because the thing <laughs> is, they all start with almost identical words. And then, because again, when you get past short-term memory, this is the glory of it. it, it I've never heard one that was even close to being the same, really, word mm -hmm. for word. They yeah. make it their own. And it's a beautiful experience. Mm -hmm. What they see is, this is a very, and it's very Anabaptist, it's a high view of church. We don't usually use the word church, we call the people of God. Sin breaks four major relationships. The relationship between us and God, us and others, us and our inner selves. Oh, do students feel that? And us and the created physical world. And God's solution to this terrible problem. And note that when you define sin that broadly like that, it isn't just a matter of going to he heaven and avoiding hell. Mm. It's about Jesus healing your problem with your mod mate and you're fighting all the time. And the shame inside of you. Mm. God is solving, still solving, this problem by creating a chosen for a mission, not God's favorite, Covenant, obeying God, shalom. Shalom means the healing of all four of those relationships. People, and then here, now here it comes, <laughs> out of all people groups. We show them something that once you see it, you can't unsee it. How God loves all people groups equally. And how Abraham and his family were chosen, not because they're God's favorites, but they're chosen. So that through them, God could reach and bless every family on earth. And maybe that fact alone has been more impactful for my students, our students, than anything you would ever imagine. Yeah. If we have time at the end, I'll actually try to do a little bit of Hiles for you. I'm ready to do that. <laughs> but we don't want to talk too much. Well. You're, what you're going to see is not students mm -hmm. actually doing the middle of the Hiles, because we could do any of that, any of us could do that for you. You're seeing the end where they talk about what it meant to them. Yeah. These are four students who are allowing us to do this. Here we go. Okay. Say, I don't know. Do I need to click it again? Maybe. How Hiles fits into my life is like going to church and stuff. Like you just go to church and you listen. And for me, it's like, okay, but I never know where it fits. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I'm like, yeah. like Paul, where is Paul? You know, yeah. <laughs> or like my grandpa will be like Old Testament, New Testament. I'm like, I don't know like what names are in the old or new. Mm -hmm. So I think Hiles is really beneficial for me now because now I can be like, oh, I know where Paul goes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this clause has changed my outlook, I'd say, on religion and the way that we should look at it. Mm -hmm. But it's changed it in a way that makes me not necessarily believe in it more, but understand the spirituality of it more. Yeah. Like stepping out of spirituality and looking at it from an objective way mm -hmm. has strengthened my make a shake that I would say. Nice. Because it just further reaffirms to me that this is not a fable. It's mm -hmm. it's it's a well put together collection of stories that can be proved in some areas of mm -hmm. science that prove that actually happened. Yeah. What mm -hmm. God what God said is 
Sure. Mm -hmm. Growing up, I did not have a religious background. Both my parents were atheists. They don't really believe in anything. Mm -hmm. um, however, they weren't the kind to really push it on us. If we wanted to try different things, like I went to youth group during middle school, junior high and high school. Um, if we wanted to try different experiences and come to our own conclusions, they uh, never pushed to put push bad things onto us. And so I've always been interested, but I've never had a good opportunity to really dive into this world of religion. Mm -hmm. um, so luckily with this class, it's been really interesting and nice to have these new experiences and learn new <clears throat> stories and maybe get rid of some stereotypes I've had in my head that were mm -hmm. negative. Mm -hmm. There's a song that I really like. Um, it's, it's, it's my favorite song, like ever on the planet. It's called Firm Foundation by Maverick City. Mm -hmm. And some of the lyrics in that say, um, it's like, Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaken, I've never been more glad. And I have put more faith in Jesus, because he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations, so why would he fail now? And so that whole idea yeah. that he's been that that he's he's been faithful through like so it, it just like mm -hmm. whenever I was going through this house of shake to remind me of that song. Yeah. yeah. Because you know, and it gives me a newfound trust in the fact that I can, I can, mm -hmm. well, that I can trust God because of what, what he's done mm -hmm. throughout this whole time. He's not really just, I don't know, he's active in our world and he's, yes. Yes. you know, yes. so he, 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 there's no doubt that he can be active now in my life. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, we're going to stop there. I mean, we do have one more barrier comments or questions and and this is just we just did this this afternoon like these were just these are just from last year that's mm -hmm. uh, yeah go ahead I have two questions how do you accommodate juniors and seniors mm -hmm. and what percentage of your juniors choose not to take the course well uh, juniors and seniors if they come through as freshmen sophomores take it as a freshman sophomore if they don't we have we actually have a separate nursing section that we do for our junior and senior nursing students who are transfers in so come in as a junior uh, so that's probably the biggest chunk of juniors or seniors that we mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. we reach um, percent of students who don't end up taking it I don't know the exact number I don't know if I would say the percentage and, is but it's pretty, pretty low. small Pretty small. I, d I do know that there's a great deal of this is a class everybody takes so there's lots of hype around it it's like you have to walk six miles to school in the snow <laughs> uphill both ways <laughs> and it becomes bragging it's rights kind I mean, of like one, that. one of the yeah, psychological kind of like things that. we have to push against <laughs> is for some strange reason Heil's Geschichte or the whole class gets more difficult every year and it's just because well no, I did this and, you know, there's, <laughs> so there's some of that we have to yeah, I don't. I mean, yeah, I don't know the exact number, but I think it's very, very low. I don't know of the students yeah. that don't take Biblet, and I do know at least for some of them, it's not only Biblet. Like there right. might be some other course that they didn't take. Either. Also, is yeah. why they're choosing not to get a degree with us. Yeah. But yeah, it's pretty low. Even like as you saw, like some of our students, none. Of, well, sorry, one of those four students was a Bible major. The rest of them are. One was an aviation major. Uh, I don't even know what yeah. psychology and one but almost dropped because he didn't want to take yeah it. one of those students was really really say, angry at us uh, about a month into the class and almost dropped and then by the end and by the end of his hiles it was like yeah this has completely changed who i am and so hiles uh we sometimes lovingly call it something that's spelled almost the same as Hiles oh, when yeah, it's no. Hiles yeah, week. No. Yeah. <laughs> um, because it can be a it's pretty tough. brutal week for us. Like sometimes we're sitting uh, and listening for 20 to 30 hours of, of Hiles. And so sometimes it gets a little long. But man, when we get to the end and when they're sharing the connections that they've made, um, oh. and you just saw a little, little snippet, it really makes it all worth it and makes yeah. it like, yeah, this is why I'm here. And I wish other faculty and administrators could sit and listen to all those because I just They're think precious. it's a really, yeah. it's a huge gift. Yeah. And it's one of the reasons why, I'll, why I will fight to keep teaching Biblet as long as I can, because it's just a blessing for me 
every time, even though it's, it's difficult and it's a really long, busy week. And, uh, you know, I used to make fun of Marion for uh, fighting to stay awake sometimes when he was listening to them. And now we just, I learned a great trick from Michelle. Yeah, you know what, Hiles week, you just eat a lot of calories that week because you just snack and you stay awake. And, yeah. But it's, it's so great. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's been my impression that there's just a lot of what I call spiritual propaganda. Hmm. You know, lots of programs. And I hate to call it a driving gear when I was trying to find a radio station to listen to and, and I had trouble finding one that wasn't, you know, what I thought of as spiritual propaganda. <laughs> um, <clears throat> do you, is that full frequency or just hmm. Or different, or, yeah. Hmm. Uh, maybe, but I kind of try to not focus too much on that. Some of the students who have the most difficulty with the inductive Bible study are the ones who've been in Sunday school their whole lives because they're like, know this, don't have to, don't have to study. Mm -hmm. And so that we did. And, mm -hmm. and some of our ones for whom this is all brand new, hmm. then, then it comes. Here's the beautiful thing. More and more, we're living in a world where students don't know the biblical story, and they also, we're also starting to lose what I call American civil religion. It's still pretty tight, but we're starting to loosen our grip, which is also really good. So I'll we'll have students who don't realize it's impolite to say that Jesus is stupid. Hmm. So we'll be in the Sermon on the Mount. We do a lot of time in the Sermon on the Mount. You know, and Jesus says, don't even look at somebody with lust in your eyes. And I've heard students go, well, that's... That's the stupidest thing I've heard in my absolute life. And you can get panicky about that, or you can go, yes, <laughs> because I just got an honest response. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And honesty is the beginning of much, much learning, much, much learning, mm. because my Christian students are sitting in there, and they're thinking the same thing, but just won't say it. Mm. And wow, when somebody opens, gives us that opportunity, yeah then we can have a great discussion. It does kind of seem like Jesus is asking a lot. And then it just, oh, <laughs> just, oh. Yeah. I think, I mean, partly to answer your question also, we try, we don't shy away from like yeah. what we believe, but we are really, we just try and say over and over and over, like it's okay if you don't agree with us. Yeah. Like this is Anabaptist Mennonite beliefs. This is what we believe. It's okay if you don't agree with us, but we're still asking you at least for this course to learn it, right? Mm -hmm. But you, it's okay if you don't agree with us. So yeah, we get lots of different uh, flavors, <laughs> varieties of Christians, but also with our, with our large international uh, population, we get lots of different other religions also. So yeah. uh, we kind of handle those all similarly. Like we stay, try and stay focused on what we believe, the Bible. Uh, the how Bible. the Bible, yeah. you know, can be seen differently by different people. But um, and yeah. that's a great foray into the third barrier. Yeah, actually, that's like, what I can I do that? And then we'll yeah. take more questions. Yeah, so yeah. barrier number three. So we're, you might throw the Bible away because it's not relevant. It's an old fuddy-duddy book with weirdo stories. You might throw the Bible away because it's not user-friendly. I mean, that's what the modern world is saying. But the third reason you might throw the Bible in the trash, metaphorically, is because <laughs> the stupid thing, it dis the st you know what I mean? Just, I'm just trying to keep you awake. It disagrees with itself. It's not accurate. On yeah. certain key ethical issues. Mm -hmm. It actually disagrees in some details in other ways, too. But what we focus on are the ethics. And when students kind of figure that out, they're like, and then they go, you mean we could do a really, really good inductive study and we'd still have this problem with the two? And I'm like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we help students work with that issue. We won't have time, well, we haven't had time to play with all, really all well of these barriers, but we actually end with a segment on ethics. And, and so first of all, it's kind of painful for my Christian students to realize mm -hmm. how much the Bible d disagrees on capital punishment, on war, on divorce, on some other things, like it just does. But let's love the Bible enough to see yeah. the whole thing. Even, oh, yeah, I yeah. was gonna ask you that question. That's okay. By the okay. end of Friday, I have lost my <laughs> Teacher of the Year award. 
I mean, even this is an example, right, of different Christians believing different things. Like the first time that I took Bib Lit, I was pretty upset at Marion when he showed us Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, and that there's two different creation accounts, and they don't really completely line up. If you're looking for them to line up perfectly, they don't. And I was like, what? I was 30-some years old. I'd read the Bible, especially Genesis 1 and 2, because, you know, when you start at the beginning and you're going to read through in a year, you always get Genesis 1 and 2. And I had (laughs) never, ever heard anybody say that, you know, in church, or never realized, like, these are two different accounts. They don't actually line up. If you're trying to make them line up perfectly, day by day, things are ordered, are created in different orders. They don't line up. People, humans, are created differently, much differently in Genesis 1 and 2. So, uh, yeah, Marion kind of freaked me out a little bit, and uh, I had to try and, like, still stay engaged, and that's the same with some of our students today, right? So some of our students who come from churches or families where, like, the Bible is exactly perfect and every single word of it is exactly spoken directly from God and there's never a disagreement, we're like, sorry, there's actually places where prophets disagree, There's actually places where it seems like uh, the Bible is saying two opposite things, right? Uh, So what do we do with that? Our answer is we don't shy away from it or pretend it doesn't exist. Uh, We talk about it. We talk about it. And even, like, I love talking about women, right, women in leadership. Like Paul says in reading the verse, like, women shouldn't even, should be silent in churches. Like, what the heck are we doing? Why are we letting Michelle talk? It's terrible, (laughs) right? Yeah, why would we do that? Uh, but yet, we also know Paul said other things about women and gave women uh, responsibility and put, him in, put them in charge of churches and asked them to do really important leadership tasks. So what else is there? How can we look at these issues without just debating and getting angry with each other? So there's lots of several different things that we do. So it's called hermeneutics. We know we have the hermeneutical bridge. Now when we say hermeneutics, we're giving it a more specialized definition. It means dealing with the problem of disunity in the Bible. And we give the students the three top ways that all very sincere Christians work at to solve this problem. Flat Bible, which that is where for corporate or government issues, you follow the ethics of the Old Testament. And for personal issues, private issues, you follow the ethics of Jesus in the New Testament. That's one way to do it. We talk about some of the pros and cons of that, what that, <laughs> you know, I don't know how much I want to get into. But, and, and we very much talk about issues that are very important to our students, such mm-hmm. as whether or not a Christian should go to war. Mm-hmm. And again, we're trying to model that there is another way to think about, I mean, the majority of Christians think it is perfectly fine and even our duty to go to war. Mm-hmm. What is a different way to look at that? We actually, but we try to do it in, in, in the way we think Jesus would do it, which would be gentle. We talk about dispensational ethics, where different ethics apply to different time periods. And we talk about the possibility that that's a very convenient ethical strategy, but you can take all the stuff that you don't want to do, like be a pacifist, and you can stick that in a dispensation before you or after you. Mm-hmm. And then you get to do kind of whatever it is you want to do in your time period. That's hard. It stings a little bit, but I mean, you have, part of it is we're trying to teach critical thinking and ethical thinking. And, and, and our students just, once they get started, they, you cannot shut them up. They're talking about this. <laughs> we do a worksheet on this. We work at this. And then we give them, and we're honest about our favorite approach, and that is what we to do. We call it Christocentric. Mm -hmm. hermeneutics or Christ-centered and basically it goes like this when the Bible seems to disagree Jesus is the referee Boom. and that's the Anabaptist (laughs) Mennonite that's a main way that we actually read our Bibles we read our Bibles through the lens of Jesus Hmm. so Hmm. we basically teach them about there's there's so this class also really highly values free will And people in their free will sometimes have chosen to disobey God. Mm -hmm. And that's been written up in the Old Testament. And then it's like, oh, so we're supposed to do that? Well, we have to make some discernments as to whether or not that's 
really what God wanted or is what God allowed people to do in their free will? Yeah. And it's a fascinating discussion. Not all of our students will disagree with it, but what they have to do is they have to grapple with it. And then we show them some verses. Hebrews 1, 1 through 3 would be a great example. Where, and that passage actually says that Jesus is the exact imprint of God. And Jesus is the one who exemplifies and reflects God completely. So when the scriptures disagree, this passage would say we do look to Jesus. Mm -hmm. and, and, mm -hmm. it's a, and for some of our students, this is the most important part of the class. Yeah. Okay? I would, the last thing I was going to say mm -hmm. that we do, uh, teaching Biblia in a modern world, we try to have fun. Uh, oh, yes. We like what we're doing. We like our job. Uh, we try to have fun with the students. So we play Minute to Win It every Friday. Minute to Win It every Friday. And we're trying to carry some of that over into uh, our campus pastor role. So Michelle used these today earlier. And I think I heard some people say, what the heck? Why was she holding a pair of cleats up while she was praying? Do you want to tell them what this is about? I will. I yeah? will. In Greek, <clears throat> we say the word paraclete for the Holy Spirit. And thank you, President Joe. You did a marvelous <laughs> opening uh, speech or sermon the first day. And, and so we decided to run with this. Oh, we hope all year round this symbol of the Holy Spirit is found in a variety of places. Mm -hmm. What I really like about it, <laughs> the Holy Spirit is the paraclete, but, and the para, you know, the, the little pun on words, paracletes. <laughs> but I also can uh, see the Holy Spirit as helping me, right? I'd be a better softball player if I had these cleats. And the Holy Spirit helps us in that way too. Mm -hmm. Not that I'm a good softball player, but. Yeah. And one, we have these stickers that go along with our theme verse every year, uh, which is also kind of fun. If you remember the 80s and Back to the Future, that's kind of the theme for this. Uh, but we can because Christ is. That really is kind of sums up why we're here. Michelle yep. and I both why we do this. Uh, love uh, talking about Jesus, love talking about the Bible and the timeline, but it really goes back to Jesus and the center, and that's how we interpret uh, who we are and why we're here. So if you'd like one of these, there's lots of these, and President Joe makes more yeah. all the time. So you can get uh, five of these if you want um, uh, mm -hmm. as, on your way out. If you want to come talk to us, uh, yeah, we'd love to chat questions. with you, you bet. Um, we'll for a little bit, and you can grab a sticker, and yeah, thank you all thank for Thank you, thank you, thank yeah, yeah. you, thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. I just wanted to remind you of what is coming up after this. Um, you have free time now. There is time to explore, you know, the campus. You can take a tour with Andy Sharp. He is going to be meeting in front of the ad building. Um, you can visit the bookstore, take your coupon, and, and buy, get a good deal. Um, and, you know, just walk around, look at our flags, our, our global flags to, that show the countries represented by our students mm, this yeah. year. You can walk over to, or get over to the Dick Arbor, Arbor, <clears throat> Arboretum and, and view that. And then um, join us for dinner at the uh, Bontrager Student Center for our international dinner. We'll <clears throat> where we'll have tiki masala, and there are other options. Um, please come to the volleyball game at 6.30 at Yoast, and then there's a reverse Druber, Druber's run at 8, and I'm not sure about the alumni softball game. Who knows? Is it still on? It's on? Okay. I heard there were some injuries or something. Is on? Okay. Yes. Softball game. So please come to the softball game. <laughs> yes. Well, and you're going to wear your cleats? Okay. Okay. Yes. So please enjoy the rest of the evening. And um, if you want to talk to Nick and Michelle, get some stickers. Go for it. Thank you.